It is my absolute pleasure to be here. I don't get to give talks in my hometown terribly often. I don't get to ever talk in buildings as beautiful as this. And I love the idea of kicking off a conference about delight, because frankly, that is my wheelhouse almost every day of my job. Of course, I have to give you something less delightful, which is a legal disclaimer. Um, really, what this says is trademarks are well taken care of, and you shouldn't invest on anything I'm about to tell you. You should invest in Intel, because we're amazing. So, what I. Moving on. So what I thought I would do for the next 45 minutes is tell you a little bit about this really interesting intersection I live at and the ways in which we can think about it for things that I think are useful for imagining how to deliver technology and experiences that matter. For me, I think there's something really important in 2014 going frighteningly into 2015 to remember that while we talk about technology all the time and we recite brands and companies as though they were, I don't know, the end of everything and the beginning of everything, we're all resolutely human beings. And what I want to talk about and reflect on is what it is that makes us human in a digital world and why it is that those are things we ought to pay attention to. Because my suspicion is running through many parts of our lives, there are a series of lessons that we can draw from and significantly deliver technologies and experiences that would actually make people terribly, terribly happy. There are lots of ways of introducing me. My ponderous list of titles is one of them. A much better way to introduce me is to tell you that I'm an anthropologist. So I study people for a living. My job, my career, my life's goal in some ways is to get to spend time with people in the places they make meaning in their lives, get a sense of what makes them tick, what they care about, what frustrates them, what they love, and use all of that to drive new technology development at Intel. But that wasn't always my chosen path. I'm also, by way of confession, the daughter of an anthropologist. So I grew up in my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. Hence the reason I know how to get water out of frogs. It's not just that I was a tortured child. I was actually raised by indigenous people on their country in a time when they still remembered what that country was like before white fellas and fences and cattle. And I spent most of my early childhood living in those communities. No shoes, speaking another language, I didn't go to school terribly often. My mother doesn't like it when I say that uh, in public. But you know, I got into Stanford, so obviously it wasn't that bad. <laughs> but it was an extraordinary childhood, right? Living with people on their country in a world that in some ways doesn't really exist anymore. And it left me with some really important lessons, particularly given to me by my mother, who was a single parent, who'd taken herself back to school, who was striving to have a career against many of the odds, and who, in living with indigenous people, came to the realization that social justice mattered more than almost anything. And when I was a little girl, my mother impressed on both my younger brother and I this incredibly important lesson, that if you could see a better world, you were morally obligated to go make it happen. You should put your heart, your soul, your body, your intellect, your passion on the line to make that world come to be. Because if you weren't doing it, Maybe no one else would. And that was an extraordinary lesson to learn as a kid. And it propelled me through a career that took me into the university system and into being a professor at Stanford in the late 1990s. And truthfully, I thought that's where I would end up. I liked teaching. I thought it was good work. It was a way to change the world, right? And then in March of 1998, in a bar in Palo Alto, now long since closed, I met a man who changed my life. For Americans, I hasten to add, I didn't marry him. I didn't have his children. I didn't even sleep with him. But nonetheless, he changed my life entirely because he asked me two simple questions. He asked me what I did, and I told him I was an anthropologist. He said, what's that? So I explained it to him. And he said, what do you do with that? And I said, somewhat smugly, I will confess, I'm a professor at Stanford. And he went, that's nice, couldn't you do more? Which was an extraordinary thing to hear at that particular moment in my life, and so I left because strange men in bars who offer opinions you don't like, you get the luxury of just walking off. <laughs> and so I walked off, which made it all the more surprising when he called me the next day at my house. Because my mother, like I'm sure some of your mothers, told me not to give my number to strange men in bars. And so I hadn't given him my number, or frankly my name. And this is before LinkedIn, Facebook, Friendster. This is before there was a white box on the internet into which you could have typed redheaded Australian anthropologist. And my name would have popped up. No, he did it the old fashioned way. He called every anthropology department in the Bay Area looking for me, which is conviction. And when the Stanford secretary of the anthropology department said, oh, do you mean Genevieve? Would you like her home phone number? 
a thing for which I am now grateful, but was less grateful at the time, I was a little surprised to have this man on the other end of my telephone saying, you seem interesting. I'm like, you're not. <laughs> and one thing ultimately led to another, and I realized that you know, the promise of free lunches would get me to do almost anything. Um, he introduced me to a bunch of people in the valley who ultimately introduced me to the people at Intel who desperately, desperately wanted me to come join them. But they couldn't tell me what my job would be. The job interview was a harrowing experience, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, Intel had just discovered behavioral interviewing and thought that meant you should subject the candidate to the behavior you were interested in seeing their response to, not ask them about how they felt when subjected to it. <laughs> Which was a critical but subtle difference. I experienced my interview as people screaming at me for six hours. They experienced it as me being very good in handling constructive confrontation. <laughs> at the end of the day, they were in love and I was leaving. But ultimately, over a six-month period, Intel wooed me. They convinced me that I should leave Stanford and come to the tech field. And part of what convinced me ultimately wasn't them, but the voice of my mother in the back of my head saying, if this technology thing, this digital internet thing, is going to be as big as it looked back in 1998, which I grant you was like pre-Cambrian, but you know, back in the day, it looked like it might be a big thing, and it looked like it might impact everything. The way we talked about money, and relationships, and religion, and sex, and politics, and food, and the way we organized our bodies and our time. And I thought to myself, if that's really what it's going to be, do I want to leave that entire future up to engineers? <laughs> and I'm the daughter of an engineer, and the granddaughter of two engineers, and I love engineers. Some of my best friends are engineers. But I'm also aware that it is a particular worldview that I thought might need, oh, I don't know, a small cranky feminist Australian in the middle of the mix going, excuse me, let me tell you about people. And so I called Intel back up and said, I'm, sign me up, I'm on my way. And they went, okay, very good. And so I turned up, second day in the office, my new boss, and remember, these are people who couldn't give me a job description, right? Second day, the new boss sits me down and says, oh, you're here, so exciting. We need your help with two things. I'm like, okay. And those would be, oh, my new boss says, we need your help with women. <laughs> I'm long time recovering academic at this point. I say, which women? My new boss says, all women. I'm like, okay, so all 3.2 billion then? Yep, says the new boss, that'd be great. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do with 3.2 billion women? I say, and the new boss says, well, if you could help us understand them, that'd be great. Tell us what they want. I'm like, okay, good. Well, there's a task. So in my notebook, I write down women all and underline the all. <laughs> and try to imagine what is the task you would do to explain women all to a silicon manufacturing company. So many problems, right? First of all, you have to explain why women all isn't actually a meaningful category. Then you need to do work that does establish meaningful categories. And then there was going to be an act of tremendous translation. And I'm a researcher, so those are the problems you love to have more than anything else. And then I realized that this new boss had said there were two things. And if number one is women, it is troubling to imagine what number two might be. <laughs> and I'm sure I secretly hoped this new boss would say men, because then that'd be everything. And that's always a good problem to have. But no, the new boss said that they had an ROW problem at Intel, and they'd like my help on that too. And I didn't know what ROW was, so I asked where I was promptly informed that ROW was rest of world. I'm like, okay, so let me guess. Where's world in this sentence? My boss says, oh, that's America. Okay, so you'd like me to go investigate everyone who isn't in America? Yes, she said, that would be great. I'm like, okay, so to recap then, my job is women and everyone who isn't here. <laughs> and she said, yes, that would also be good. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I think I've just landed the best job in history but also the most daunting job a person can have, right? Because my job at that point became explaining everyone who wasn't in the building to everyone who was in the building. And in some ways, that has been my job ever since. I'm lucky I have a team of people who I get to work with whom I delight in every day. And I get to have the extraordinary privilege and pleasure of trying to bring human voices into the technology domain. And that is a lifetime's worth of work, I think. And I could tell you lots of things about that, but I wanted instead to reflect on the other part of my job that isn't just about the present, but also about what the stories are we tell about the future. 
because the stories we tell about the future are actually stories we tell about new products. They're the same thing, right? Every time we talk about a new product, a new brand, a new experience, we're actually telling a story about a future we hope to bring into existence. And those stories are deeply, in some ways, uh, loaded, right? They embody our hopes and our fears about the present as much as they do about the future. This is a piece of brand and collateral from 1957, it appeared in Time magazine. It was put in there by a collection of Californian electrical companies. And it has, as you can see, a self-driving car. In the text that went with it, this same company, Constellation, talked about the fact that we were going to have a small box in the kitchen that heated food in minutes, not hours. Microwave, check. That there'd be a box outside your back door that heated your house in winter and cooled your house in summer. Ooh, central heating, check that television would become a flat panel on the wall, like a glass window, not a big box, check. That lights would turn on and off when it got dark and windows and drapes might close and shut automatically, well, half check. And that we would be driving self-driving cars, not so much. Getting closer, but 50 years on, we still haven't quite accomplished it, right? The story they were telling then about why you needed autonomous driving vehicles was of course one about safety and security and congestion. Those should sound like familiar anxieties. I imagine were we to see collateral today of a self-driving car, it probably wouldn't have a nuclear family in it with him behind the driving seat in a tie. Because this is very much a picture of 1958, right? But there's something in these stories that are really seductive. We know to recognize that as the past, but we also know it's a story about the future. Much the same way if I were to show you this picture, you know this is historic. I mean, you know this is, even for those of us who weren't alive then, you know that's America in the 1950s. Everything is a dead giveaway. The clothes, the Coca-Cola bottle, the very large television that doesn't have a remote control but the youngest child sitting near it to turn the channel. And when you look at that, we can say that's the past. And we know it's the past because everything has changed, right? Everything in it is different. Because I show you this picture and you go, oh yeah, clearly everything is different. Content is being delivered by a different mechanism, no longer over the air, now it's the internet and cable and DVDs and God knows what else. The television itself is different, it's no longer the same technology, it's flat panel, it's on a wall. You don't need to put your youngest kid in front of it to change the channel anymore because now we have remote controls. But importantly, something hasn't changed and it's the thing that always gets lost when we tell stories about the future. What hasn't changed here when everything else changed? What hasn't changed is that we still love a good story. We don't care if it comes on a flat panel screen, on our laptop, on our phone, on a bus. But if you can give us a story we can get lost in, we are happy creatures. And oh, by the way, that story can run the gamut from, you know, homeland, reasonably good, through housewives of New Jersey, LA, Houston, and wherever else we have housewives these days on television. The content doesn't matter as much as the experience of a story that transports us. Because basically one of the things that makes us human is we like a good story. But when we talk about technology and transformation, it's really easy to think that the technology is changing us at the same rate that it is changing itself. And my suspicion is that's not the case. In fact, what I want to suggest here is that there are five things in particular that make us resolutely human. And I would argue these haven't changed in a century, maybe not a millennia. And if you want to think about how to delight people, if you hit on any one of these things and you get it right, you will make people blissfully happy. Now, they look different in different places, they've had a different transformation over the arc of time, but five things that ultimately make us human and make people really happy when you get them right, and they're really straightforward. Turns out as human beings, we need friends and family. You may not always love them, you may not want to spend holidays with them, but ultimately as human beings we are deeply social creatures and we need friends and family. And that need has actually driven and propelled technology development for nearly 100 years. The first phone calls that were made back when phones still were large black things that sat in your hallway and didn't move very far, were not asking about the stock price or the weather. They were more about, how are the kids? I'm coming home, what are you doing? It wasn't important stuff except that it was important social glue. Friends and family have driven most of the major apps and websites and features in the last decade. This is what Facebook is about. This is what Friendster was about before it. This is ultimately what a whole lot of technologies are about. How do you connect us to the people that we care about and care about us? We're also lucky in the arc of our lifetimes what it means to have a family has been transformed dramatically. 
and it's kind of delightful to imagine that we can now talk about family and imagine whether or not the Supreme Court wants to take on cases about it as of this morning, that family might not necessarily have to be a nuclear family with a husband and a wife and kids. It may be gay, it may be interracial, it may in fact be a nuclear family because God knows those are going to become the minority any minute now. But there's something here about what it means to think about friends and family and about how you create technologies that let us experience that that's hugely important. Get this one right and you always win. Get it wrong and you make people really cranky. Second one, beyond our need to be known intimately by our closest people, we also really like to belong to communities of practice and communities of people who share our interests and our values. I recently had the extraordinary experience of being in Knoxville on the opening game of the Knoxville, University of Tennessee, University of Tennessee Knoxville Volunteers football game, not really my usual football, uh, 102,000 people in the stadium, 101,000 of them wearing orange because that is the colour of this particular team and 101,000 of them screaming at the top of their lungs to like 100 decibels. It was an extraordinary experience and everything was orange, right? It was orange coming into the game. They have orange Dixie cups. It was excellent. Food was orange. I mean, there was clearly a kind of a commitment to, right, and in fact, I turned up without any orange and people probably gifted me orange because they were concerned I didn't know how to participate. You were like, okay, I get the idea. Here is a set of people who have a shared experience, right? They have a shared commitment go vols, they have a shared you know, notion of what it means to belong to a university system and to be alumni. But we know there are lots of other patterns of this, right? Whether this is 500 years ago belonging to a guild in the arc of my lifetime in Australia being part of a union. Now it might be belonging or participating in a sport franchise, being in a community group, having your kids in the scouts, whatever the thing is, right, there are all kinds of communities that we want to participate in that share our values. And arguably, you know, early experiments on the internet were about this too. I mean, if you go back to the first days of eBay as an exchange site for Pez dispensers, it was clearly about people who shared a preoccupation, if not, a, you know, a shared set of values. I think this also explains why it is that sites like Pinterest are popular and even Etsy. They speak to a sense that we want to have an experience with people who we think are a little bit like us, right? And there's something about that that turns out to be hugely important. Laddering up that stack from friends and family to community, I would also argue that as human beings, we have an innate desire to belong to something that is bigger than ourselves. Biologists sometimes talk about the fact that there's a God gene that we need to have religion. I would argue that is certainly one way we have had meaning that was bigger than ourselves, something that meant more than who we were as individuals. We have certainly sacrificed a tremendous amount in the name of that. We also might think about it as being countries, as being kingdoms. I think, you know, in the arc of the 20 and the 21st century, I think some of this might also be about ideologies and movements, right? Whether this is about the suffragettes movement, gay rights, whether this is about democracy or liberty or freedom. There are all kinds of ideas that drive us and give us something to identify with that we are willing to tremendously put ourselves on the line for, right? And technologies clearly in the last 10 years have played a huge part in this. Just reflect on the last three weeks of what's been, the last two weeks of what's been going on in Hong Kong and think about the ways in which Twitter, mobile phones and the internet have played a part in giving that movement a voice and a presence and a set of indelible images that will carry forward that conversation. So it turns out this one is a slightly harder one to think about what you would do to build a service towards it or an application. But my suspicion is particularly in the domain of brands, this one's really important. How do you give people a sense of a belonging that is beyond themselves, right? And sometimes it's abstract and that's actually not a bad thing. Almost last but not least in this list of five things that I think make us acutely human is this idea that we need objects to talk about who we are to talk about who we are to ourselves and to other people. I'm willing to bet most of you made a decision about what you put on when you left the house this morning. You're in an industry where you will be evaluated on what you look like, right? We make decisions about the brands on our bodies, the styles of clothing, the shoes we have on, the jewelry on our fingers. We make decisions about our glasses. We make decisions about all those things. And it's not just that we're talking to others that way. We're also talking to ourselves about who we are, about what we have accomplished. And that notion of using objects is a long-standing one. 
and it extends beyond the immediacy of our bodies to what cars we drive in Portland, what bicycles we ride, what public transportation services we use. It derives to, frankly, what pieces of technology we own. The Apple fanboys, insert yourselves right here, and fangirls. You know, we know that there's a whole set of ways we identify ourselves to ourselves and others through the technology we own, even the services we subscribe to. Do you use Bing? Do you use Google? Do you use Duck, Duck, Goose? Because any one of those things says something about you, right? Do you use WhatsApp? Yes, Duck, Duck, Goose. <laughs> I can see you going there. It's always good when the improv people go, oh, that sounds like us. <laughs> uh, interesting search engine. Neither Bing nor Google, clearly. <laughs> Different notion about cookies and tracking. But lots of things there about what we use says something about us, right? And this is a place where brands have historically played a tremendous role, but we know it's more than that, right? It's also about the decisions people make about the constellations of objects and relationships. And this has been unchanging for a very long time. I mean, you know, what it is on our bodies has changed, but the notion that it's on our bodies really hasn't. And then last, but by no means least, it turns out one of the things that makes us resolutely human is we need to keep secrets and tell lies. I know you're all sitting there going, I don't do that. Turns out you do. The average human being tells somewhere between six to 200 lies a day. By the time you get to 200, you are verging on pathological, I hasten to add. But you know, six you could have got to before you got here this morning. Yes, you look fine in that. Your lunch will be okay. Yeah, that was an excellent breakfast. That talk was really quite good. Love the mimosa. I mean, and then you're almost there, right? You've got one to go and you're at a baseline and it's only, you know, 9.30 in the morning. We don't necessarily tell lies because we are bad people. Sometimes we tell them just to grease the social skids, to reassure ourselves, to not create trouble. Um, it turns out, perhaps unsurprisingly, men and women tell different kinds of lies. Uh, I have a colleague of mine who studied internet dating sites for a long time. Um, discovered that 100% of Americans report lying in their online dating profiles. Um, I'm kind of staggered by that in two ways. One, I can't think of a Americans, 100% of Americans agreeing to anything. That 100% of you can agree to lying in your online dating profiles is kind of remarkable. Um, by contrast, when the English were asked a very similar question, only 60% of them reported lying, which means I think 40% of them are lying about not lying, so that's complicated right there. But in the online dating profiles, men lied about their height, they added three inches, and women lied about their weight and shaved off five pounds. I'd like to suggest one of those is more noticeable than the other, but maybe it's just me, which actually comes to one of the critical differences, right, which is that men lie more often, but women get caught less. <laughs> So I will just leave you to ponder that one for a minute. Um, it also turns out that we have created systems on the internet that encourage some of this behavior, right? Whether it is sites like Whisper and Secret, which are clearly designed in some ways to give us a space to talk about our secrets, or whether it's the fact that many websites required you to be a particular age to sign on to them, compelling certain individuals to lie about their age. Um, there was a period of time when Friendster had 10% of its online population were octogenarians and above. It seemed unlikely, it seemed much more likely that when you signed on, the first age bracket you could get to was born in 1906. We know a lot of 14-year-olds were signing on as 90-year-olds, which just skews the data a little bit. Did they intentionally lie? No. But the system kind of required them to do so, right? We know that people have lied as a way of protecting their privacy. You know, if you tell Yahoo you're male and you're actually female, is that a lie? Hard to say, right? What does all of that suggest? But we know that technology is part and parcel both of how we keep secrets. At this point, I suspect the answer is don't put it on the internet. Maybe the only way left to keep a secret. Except that we know secrets also function as a form of reciprocity and relationship, so that gets a little more tricky. But we have been lying and keeping secrets for thousands of years. Thousands of them. And we'll continue to do so. So frankly, how you tap into this is complicated and interesting. The added wrinkle in all of it being the one thing that has changed here is that the most recent set of studies I've seen suggest that whereas lying in physical interactions in person uh, results in mild feelings of shame, guilt, remorse, depending on your religious persuasion um, or your parents' upbringing, um, it turns out lying online mostly fills us with feelings of giddy glee and delight. 
this is mildly a problem if you want to use what people are telling you online as a mechanism for doing things. If you now have a like trust gap, you may find there are some interesting problems attendant to that, but it's fascinating to imagine how that plays out, right? So if those are the five things that haven't changed and that remain persistently, stubbornly human despite technology, friends and family, community, a sense of purpose, objects, and secrets and lies, there are five things that I think we imagine that technology is putting pressure on right now. A set of things where we go, oh God, everything is different. What is fascinating is as I pushed further and further on these and looked across all the work my team and I had done, it actually became clear that these five things have had pressure put on them by technology for at least 200 years, in some cases 500 years. So they look like these crises points, these places of anxiety, but in fact the anxiety isn't new. First one of them turns out to be about reputation. Think of this as the next instantiation of an anxiety about privacy and security. Where once we are worried about what it would mean to have pieces of information running around about us, now we worry about entire collections of information running about around us, right? But it turns out that privacy and security are hardly stable concepts. What we imagine should be kept private 20, 40, 60 years ago is radically different than what we imagine ought to be kept private now. We display different parts of our bodies now than we did. We are willing to talk about different parts of our lives in public. We don't mind certain kinds of information being shared about us in ways that I think might have been extraordinarily difficult to imagine 20 years ago. By the same token, there is no single agreed upon definition of privacy. Not everyone in the world agrees that what should be private and what isn't. Not everyone agrees who should know what and under what circumstances. What we do see in all of the work we've done and the work I see of my colleagues, however, is that we increasingly worry about what judgments are being made about us because of the information that circulates about us and who has access to it. Clearly, this is more acute 18 months past Snowden, because I think we are a little more aware as a set of you know, early adopters about what information does run around about us and what may be made of it. But the notion that we worry about what people think about us isn't new. And the idea that technologies might disclose that isn't new either. At the turn of the last century, when the first hearings were happening in front of the US Congress about whether we should electrify American homes or not, part of the argument marshaled against electrification was that if you electrified people's homes, people would know what you were doing in your house after dark. Which is extraordinary, right? Well, you'd be able to see in and you'd get to see people and that might be bad. You're like, wow. Also, similarly, there was an extraordinary amount of concerns about if you electrified people's homes, you would make women and children vulnerable to predators because they'd be able to see that they were home. So some very different ideas that run through this, right? But new technologies have always put pressure on the idea about privacy and the idea about reputation too. So it's not new, but it is a huge concern. And frankly, of this list of five things, if you can find a way to tackle any one of these, you bring people closer to a state of delight and that is a good thing, right? If you can find ways of drawing down these anxieties, you can actually be hugely successful. Now, of course, you know, our current ways of drawing down this anxiety is either harder passwords, that doesn't seem to be helping. Um, you know, we're now having to worry about whether our banks are safe, the same way we had to worry about whether Target and Home Depot were safe. There is clearly a lot of anxiety in this space that is going to need to, in some ways, be addressed and resolved. Second thing that has been transforming for a long time and continues to create anxiety is this notion about how we want to be in the world, how we want to be engaged. Heidegger, of all people, German philosopher, writing in 1917, 1918, lamented the appearance of new um, media. He was talking about movies at that point and uh, the first appearances experiments with radio and the telegraph because he said all this newfangled technology is just encroaching on my ability to have time to myself. It demands all my attention. I never have any downtime. There are all these flashing lights, which is kind of wonderfully prescient, right, for nearly 100 years ago. And he said that one of the things we needed to be as human beings and we needed to commit to was the notion that we needed to commit to being bored. He said that boredom was a critical way into uh, creativity and into being innovative. And he worried 100 years ago that our lives were speeding up so dramatically that we never had those moments where we could just be still and ultimately bored. Now, flash forward 100 years, we know that problem is infinitely more complicated than it was then. We have 
oodles of things that demand our attention and our time. We have blinking lights on almost every device we have to tell us that something is happening out there we could and should be paying attention to. We take those devices with us everywhere. I'm as guilty of this as everyone else. But I remember a time not that long ago when my mother would kick me out the back door in the summer and say, come home when it's dark. And if you said, mom, I'm bored, my mother would usually say, well, you could mow the lawn then. And it turned out we were never that bored. <laughs> because we created things to do, we made up games, we made up things in our heads, we had a whole life. And it turns out, well, that makes me sound a little old fashioned, the medical sciences and psychological sciences actually have my back on this one. It turns out that when you are bored, your brain chemistry engages in a particular set of rearranging of all those neurons and neuron firings. And actually, being bored turns out to be uh, medically and biologically really important. Much the same way certain kinds of sleep patterns help us reset our minds, it turns out being bored does a similar set of things to a different pathway in the brain. So working out how we find ways of being bored, despite the fact that we live in a Protestant driven country that suggests that idle hands are the devil's work, you might actually want to work out how to be bored every now and again. It turns out that's really important, but we push against it incessantly, right? It's a constant tug of war. Second problem we have is that we also have this really um, ambivalent relationship to familiarity and surprise, which is part and parcel of this same phenomenon, right? On the one hand, we live in a world where all of our recommendation systems, Netflix, Amazon, whatever else is in your world, dating sites apparently, um, say, okay, you liked that thing? Well, you're gonna like all the other things just like it in some domain, right? You liked that movie? Well, here are movies with that actor, by that director, set in that place, on that theme, in that period. Select and go. What those algorithms are playing on is the familiar, right? Here is a thing that was familiar to you. Let me find other things that are passingly familiar. And as human beings, that is very comforting to us. Give us something we like, then give us lots of things we like, just like it. We also know, and it is acutely known, I would say, in the content generation space, so the music industry, the movie industry, the food industry, clothing to fashion, is that human beings go through familiar, 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 stunningly bored, wishing to be surprised. And you can see that if you track television. I go back to picking on my Housewives of New Jersey. We had a lot of reality TV shows, Housewives of New Jersey, Housewives of Orange County, Housewives of Dallas, Housewives of wherever else. And then suddenly you had Breaking Bad and Mad Men and then Game of Thrones being a television show so not the Housewives of anywhere that you can actually watch the premiere of season three, episode one, change global internet traffic most pirated show in history, and you could actually see the day it went out, as my country and many others downloaded it en masse, and the internet just ticks up. And what does that tell you, right? Familiar, 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 waiting to be surprised, tracking back to familiar, and because now we have lots more shows that are high drama, high period piece, high narrative base. Imagining what an algorithm will do that does that is actually really tricky. How do you predict when people are trending to be bored, how do you know when they're ready to be surprised? And how do you surprise them enough without freaking them out or without being deeply creepy? Is actually an interesting Gordian knot to unthread. Because we see it all the time, right? I'm sure you have seen various scenarios of here is your smartphone, it's me, I'm in Portland. Oh God, they know I love coffee. Genevieve, here are three places you can get a flat white in town. Australian coffee, oh happiness. And it's only one place, truthfully, but it's just over there. So. You could just go over there and get your flat white, or if you went that way, 10 paces, there's a piece of art that's transcendent and it will make you weep. And imagine what it would be to have a personal assistant on your device that said that to you, that didn't necessarily fulfill your desire for coffee, but moved you in a different direction. Not every day, that would probably become irritating. But there's something there about how do you engineer for delight and surprise, which also means you have to know where is boredom and how much boredom is necessary. So, Threading that set of knots is really complicated, but is also a thing that technology has been intimately acquainted with with a long time, whether it's about content on radios, on television, music, all of those things, mass-produced food, we know that there's a space there, right? Next thing we know that is complicated in this space and has always been true about technology is that as human beings, we desperately want to be different from each other we want countries to be different from other countries. We want to know that we're not the same as everyone else. 
but we also have this sense of the homogenization of things, right? What does it mean to say, I want to be different if we're all using the same service? Of course, the reality is we aren't all using the same service, and indeed the internet is experienced radically differently in different parts of the world. But there is this constant and incredible tension here about the desire to have difference while also wanting to embrace the same platforms other people are embracing. And the tension there is an important one to be attentive to. I'm not sure there's an obvious solution to it, but I think understanding that when people say globalization, that's not always what everyone thinks is a good idea, is an interesting problem to solve, right? How do you create identity? How do you create a sense of difference in a thing that is ultimately in some ways mass produced? But the tension here is constant, right? We've always worried about how not to be like something else. Growing up in Australia, we worried about being, you know, deluged with American television. Would it turn us into Americans? The answer was it didn't, but we worried about it a lot. I think, you know, we worry about, you know, are our children going to learn to not speak English because they constantly text? I mean, there's all sorts of things here that we worry about, but this notion of what it means to think about difference and sameness, hugely important. I think we also want to constantly feel time, and that's been under pressure for a long time. When electrical lighting first came along, it changed our ideas about day and night. When gas lighting came along, it actually changed our sleeping patterns. We stopped sleeping in the ways we had slept for thousands of years, which was in multiple pieces, and started to sleep in this one coherent block. And now we have technology that functions best when it's constantly connected. Constantly connected to power, constantly connected to content, constantly connected to the ether. And as human beings, we function better when we are intermittently disconnected. There is a reason why every major world religion has ideas about different kinds of time. Whether it's Salah in the Islamic tradition to remind you five times a day to stop and pause and breathe and be in a very different headspace. Whether it's about the difference between weeks and weekends between Ramadan and Lent and the rest of the seasons, whether it is about festivals and rituals and occasions that ask you to in encounter time differently. We are hardwired to do that, and yet we are sitting in a moment where the devices in our lives demand that we don't. And how you start to fragment and fracture that is really kind of an interesting problem. I saw a delightful demo uh, by a young Korean student at NYU's IPT program two weeks ago called Carrier Pigeon. And it was a, an app that proposed to send messages at the speed of carrier pigeons over the internet. Fabulous, right? So you log on, you put in your geolocated code of where you are, you put in the geolocation of where the other person is, and you release this digital pigeon, which proceeds to fly from wherever you are to wherever they are at the speed of a pigeon. <laughs> now, some of my colleagues went, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, the thing about the internet is it's instant. I'm like, yeah, but the thing about relationships and time is that sometimes you want to be able to celebrate the distance and feel that, right? And there was something delightful about using a digital medium to remap a different idea about time. Because part of what it said was sometimes things are going to be worth waiting for, right? They're going to be worth just a little bit of effort. And of course, last but by no means least, I think the most complicated thing about us as human beings is we desperately want to periodically be forgotten. We want to be remembered for all the things about which we are marvelous. We want to be celebrated for our accomplishments. But occasionally we want to forget. We want to forget things we said. We want to be forgotten ourselves. We want not to be remembered for some of the foolish things we did. And we live in a world where the technology discourse proposes that we will be remembered in perpetuity in full bleed living color, instant data access. And when I think about some of the things I have done in the arc of my lifetime, and I'm willing to bet that many of you have done too, do you really want all of that to be remembered and easily accessible? Not just for the sake of embarrassment, but because part of what lets us be human is we can move past the mistakes we made, we can move past what we have done and reinvent ourselves just a little bit. And one of the challenges about a world that proposes to remember everything is it's a little hard to imagine what reinvention would look like there. I think it might also be hard at a meta level to imagine what forgiveness looks like too. And there's something here about the fact that as humans we desperately want the right to be forgotten and forgiven that is a little hard to make sense of in a world where everything is remembered. So where does that leave us and what does that mean for our future? Well, in my mind it leaves us with these two lists, right? A list of things that are unchanging. And my bet is if you market towards those, if you develop towards those, the unchanging ones, you're always going to have a winner, 
right? Those are things we know people care about. Those are things we know move and motivate people. I think if you can solve any problem on this side of the list, if you can find a way to unthread and untangle the Gordian knot, if you can find a way of untangling one of those spaces, of finding a pathway through it, you will also move people. You will provide the opportunity that people could be delighted. And you will create the space in some ways to give people a little bit of room to move through that list that we started with from Forrester about the emotionality, about the usefulness, about the pleasure. But as long as there are nagging anxieties for people, it's hard to get to pleasure all the time, right? It's hard to get to being happy. <laughs> so for me, there's something here about this as an orientation to the things we know that make people resolutely human. It's both sets of things, right? It's the things that frame us, but it's also the things that worry us. And for me, as I think about the next generation of technology development, the next generation of devices, of experiences, of services, I know it's really easy to be seduced by the pace at which technology moves and to forget that ultimately in all of this, we're at the middle of it. You know, we haven't yet had the Cartesian revolution to decenter us. Singularity not arrived yet. You know, we are still the human beings in the middle of all of this. And as we make those experiences and devices and technologies, I hope we make them with an eye to remembering that what makes us human is what is delightful. So with that, I'll say thank you.